My name is Jake Donham. I work at Twitter, and I want to talk to you today about leverage versus autonomy in a large software system. Um, I, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and had some trouble getting back to sleep, so I edited my slides. So I'm interested to find out what's in my slides uh, this morning. We'll see. Um, OK. So let me start out by sort of talking about the domain um, that I'm talking about. Um, how many people here, uh, raise your hand if you work for a big company, however you define that. OK, good. So maybe you'll understand some of these problems. Um, I work at Twitter. It's a big company. We have uh, hundreds of people collectively building uh, the Twitter software system. And I want to talk about this question of how do you make good use of these hundreds of people building a large system? Um, so let's, let's try to um, refine the question a little bit. What does it mean to make good use of software engineers? Um, one thing that might mean is that you ship your features faster. It might mean that you keep your costs down. Or it might just mean that you're keeping people happy. Um, I want to sort of synthesize those and say that we want to avoid wasting people's time because we're going to help them ship faster, uh, keep our costs down, and also keep them happy. Um, OK, and uh, how do we make good use of people? Um, we have a bunch of leverage that we could, we could move here. Uh, we have development processes, um, training, culture, things like that. But I want to focus on the software architecture. Um, that's, that's the question I'm interested in. So here's a, here's a more refined way to ask the question. Um, how do you organize a large software system so hundreds of engineers working on it can avoid wasting their time? Um, and I just want to give you a caveat. Um, these are my observations about how things have gone on Twitter. Um, I don't necessarily know what's going to work in your environment, but I hope it gives you a useful way to think about this problem. Um, OK. So I want to start with this idea from uh, this sort of classic management book by Andy Grove, who was CEO of Intel for a long time. Um, this is a pretty good book, but there's this one part of it that really resonates for me, which is this idea of um, how do you organize a big, a big company into teams? Um, you, can have this, you can have a functional team, which is a team that's sort of focused on a specific function, uh, maybe sales or recruiting or um, managing your office or something like that. And that team benefits from economies of scale and sort of from specialization. So it's doing one thing. It knows how to, the team knows how to do it well. Um, and there's a lot of leverage for people outside the team. If they want some, some recruiting done or some marketing done, they go to this team, and they don't have to put in a lot of effort. Um, they get a lot of, a lot of output from that, that efficient team. Um, on the flip side, a functional team has to deal with a lot of different customers and sort of juggle resources between the customers. Um, a mission-oriented team, on the other hand, is sort of focused on a particular product or business mission end-to-end -end and performs a range of functions. Um, they may, you know, a startup looks a lot like this, obviously. Um, you do all kinds of things in a startup. Um, but you don't benefit from economies of scale so much because your, your attention is split all over the place. You don't benefit a lot from specialization of your expertise. Um, but a mission-oriented team can work faster because it doesn't need to wait on other teams or compete with other teams for resources. And Andy Grove puts it as that, you know, um, speed is the only advantage of a mission-oriented team, but it's a really big advantage. And so organizations tend to be hybrid in some way. They have um, parts of them that are functionally oriented and parts that are mission-oriented. Okay. Um, here's another idea that I'm sure you've come across, uh, Conway's Law, which I've sort of... Uh, put in its trivial form here. Software tends to look like the organization that, that builds it. Um, kind of like pet owners tend to look like their pets, something like that. OK, small laugh. <laughs> uh, and I, I, this is sort of like, an, it's funny because it's a true thing. It's, it's like um, software tends to look like the organization that, build it because, that builds it because people have a hard time you know, agreeing. They all want to sort of do things their own way, and so you end up um, with software that reflects the, the political rifts in an organization, something like that. Um, Conway was trying to say something a little, a little bit more refined. Um, basically, that the structure of the design tends to follow the organizational structure um, because of communication. Because when you decide to build a big system, um, the first thing you need to do is sort of split it up into parts so that you can work on them in parallel. And that tends to fix the structure of everything you do. So you, you divide into parts, you define interfaces, you know, we do this in software all the time, and that has a huge impact on how the software ends up being organized. Um, another way to put this, uh, sometimes called Copeland's Law, is sort of the negative of this, which is that if your software doesn't match your organizational structure, you have a lot of problems. You have a lot of split responsibilities. Um, it can be difficult to 
um, to operate your systems like this. And I'll give some examples of that uh, coming up. Um, this happens very often. Uh, at least at Twitter, it's much easier to change the org chart than it is to change the software architecture. And so, um, you know, pieces of software may get moved, moved around the organization, um, but, and so the, the match is not always perfect. And then there are aspects of software that are really cross-cutting, and so it's really hard to sort of centralize them in a single team. Um, okay, so I want to sort of synthesize these two ideas and basically take Andy Grove's idea and apply it to architecture and say that um, if our systems are centralized, we get more leverage, right? We can get more done with less effort. Um, if our systems are decentralized, we have a lot more autonomy. Um, we can do whatever we want. We don't have to wait on other people in the organization or, or other systems in the organization. Um, if, you, if your leverage is poor, you uh, end up reinventing a lot of wheels. Um, you waste time that way. If you don't have good autonomy, you waste a lot of time waiting on other teams and um, dealing with overcomplicated software. I'll, I'll give some examples of that coming up. Okay. Um, oh, and I wanted to say a little bit about the sort of global effects of this trade-off between autonomy and leverage. So you, you can think of this as like a per-team choice. Like um, you work on a team at a big company and you have a choice whether to use something, some piece of infrastructure that the company provides or to build your own, your own thing. Um, but the aggregate of all these team choices has sort of global effects. So um, let's see, I need to make my slide bigger. I can't see what I'm talking about, okay. Um, so there's some cost to having lots and lots of autonomy. Um, it can be really hard to make global improvements across the system if everyone has their own little, little world. Um, it can be difficult to make other kinds of cross-cutting changes, like a feature change that touches many systems. Um, there's a problem of uncontrolled system complexity because things are not very consistent. So different parts of your organization may use different tools, um, different platforms, whatever, um, and that just creates a lot of um, non-essential complexity. On the other hand, there's some costs of, of leverage and centralization as well. Uh, you have single points of failure and maybe um, some monoculture risks. So if everyone is using the same platforms, there may be security bugs that affect everyone at the same time or something like that. Um, you end up with arcane knowledge. So there, these centralized systems have sort of um, gatekeepers or, or, or uh, priests who know them well, uh, but other people outside um, don't really understand how things work and have to rely on the people who run those centralized systems. Um, and then there's another, there can be another form of uncontrolled system complexity, which is poor modularity. So in some of these systems, if everyone's playing in the same code base, um, there's not good boundaries between different parts of the system. Um, okay. So next, uh, I want to talk through a few examples um, of how this sort of trade-off has played out, played out at Twitter. Um, and after that, I'm going to tell you about a new system that we've been working on at Twitter that tries to slice this a different way. But let me start with these examples. Um, oh, sorry, I think I missed, <laughs> I missed a point there, which... Um, so we have this trade-off, but there are very often sweet spots in the trade-off where you get a lot of leverage, but you don't lose a lot of autonomy. So I want to start with some examples of these sweet spots. Um, okay. So I started at Twitter in about 2010, um, th where we had a big Ruby application. Um, and we had a bunch of data center machines and had to... Are people hearing feedback? Come here, feedback. No? Okay, good. Um, in our data centers, we had to sort of manually allocate systems to machines. So we, uh, we basically had a bunch of rack machines, and to get your service running, you needed to um, talk to the ops team, get machines allocated, um, you would get a list of host names, you had to set up all your deploy scripts, things like that. Um, it was, so there were two problems there. There was, uh, the ops team was sort of a choke point. And there was a lot of ad hocery. Everyone had their own um, deploy processes, their own scripts. And there was a lot of duplicated work because everyone had to sort of bring the machines up for their service. Um, move forward to today, um, almost everything at Twitter is scheduled through a cloud scheduler. Uh, we have this system called Aurora and Mesos. And it's, it's much, much better. So um, there's a huge increase in leverage, um, much less repeated work. Uh, it's much easier to get and change your capacity um, 
The deploy process is really regular. There's sort of infrastructure for that built into Aurora. So every service has its own config file, but that's sort of the extent of the variation. Um, so this is sort of a sweet spot, um, you know, because we're leveraging economies of scale and specialized expertise, um, and we didn't really have any important loss of autonomy. It's true that people can't go, uh, well, you can still log into these machines, but um, you don't have quite the freedom you did when you, you owned a single data center machine. Um, but it's not an important loss of autonomy. There isn't really anything you want to do, um, or at least that we're doing, that benefits from that. Um, one thing to notice about this is most customers want kind of the same thing. They just want a place to run some, run some code. Um, the interface to this capability is relatively simple. So we have this configuration that I was talking about for um, defining a process running in Aurora. And most of the things running at Twitter are on the JVM. So that's kind of the interface to the compute capability. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and another, another point here is that we get some global system improvement from everyone using the same system, which is that the team that runs it can continue to um, uh, do upgrades. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, we get much better utilization out of the system. So there's kind of these, these um, aggregate benefits from everyone doing things the same way. Um, there also, also are some downsides. Uh, it can be difficult to debug sort of platform level issues. If you have a, a performance issue or especially a networking issue, you pretty much need to engage the team that runs this and get their help on it. That can be hard to do um, autonomously. Um, and very rarely uh, we have bugs in the centralized platform that bring down large parts of Twitter. Um, that's sort of an unavoidable risk of centralization, um, but it doesn't happen too often. Um, Okay. So I want to talk about another sweet spot. Um, let's see. So again, uh, a long time ago at Twitter, we used the sort of raw Apache thrift clients and servers for building services. And uh, they worked fine. They, they spoke thrift, but they lacked a lot of important features for running a big system. Um, they didn't have any notion of service discovery. You had to sort of give them static host lists. Uh, they didn't have very good load balancing support. Um, they really didn't have any failure detection, statistics, tracing, all these things were missing. Uh, they had poor um, async support as well. Um, and we've since moved, pretty much everything at Twitter uses this library called Finagle, which um, embodies a lot of these features under the hood. So it has uh, service discovery integrated with Aurora, has very sophisticated load balancing and failure detection. Um, it's got a multiplex transport underneath, um, I'm not sure if, Apache Thrift has this uh, these days, but um, that's something that we added. It has good support for stats and tracing that integrate into other parts of our system. And everything is done, all of our async calls are done with features, and, and that's pretty nice. Um, so why is this a sweet spot? Um, so again, teams that use this get a ton of leverage. Um, there's sort of continuous improvement under the hood. So the team that owns Finagle is constantly adding um, improvements to how load balancing is done, to failure detection, all these things. Um, and again, there's no really important loss of autonomy. The, the interface to this is not very different from the interface to the raw Apache um, library. Um, and again, most customers want roughly the same thing. They just want to make some RPC calls. Um, that's kind of true across the system. And we have some similar, somewhat similar downsides um, that it can be difficult to debug issues in the framework. Again, you sort of need to engage the Finagle team if, for many uh, performance issues, things like that. And every once in a while, a Finagle bug will take down a big part of Twitter. Um, but on the whole, it's, it's, a, it's a huge improvement. Um, okay. So now I want to talk about some sour patches, the, the opposite of sweet spots. Um, and I want to start with talking about the original Twitter monolithic service after I drink some water. Okay, so I'm sure you um, probably heard about this before, but um, Twitter eight years ago had a, a big Ruby app. Um, everyone wrote code in the same system. And this had a lot of autonomy problems. So it was sort of a development and deploy checkpoint, or choke point. There was um, a single deploy queue that everyone had to get their branches into, which, um, broke all the time, it could sometimes take, take you days to get things through this queue. Um, the code base was really complicated, not very well organized. There wasn't a good sense of ownership. Um, it was all just sort of one big bag of code. And it was quite easy to cause cross-cutting bugs in the system. Um, 
On the other hand, there were some good things about it. So there were some things that were centralized. Um, there was one code base, there was one Git repo. Um, even though this deploy pipeline could be frustrating, there was a team that ran the deploy pipeline. There was a CI system that another team ran. Um, there was observability built into this. And it was pretty easy to make cross-cutting changes if you needed to, sort of the flip side of cross-cutting bugs. And there was good knowledge specialization. So application developers could work in this Ruby code base and there were other, other teams that worked on the Ruby VM, for instance, uh, the deploy, as I was saying. So people actually got good leverage out of the system, even though it had a lot of problems. Um, so what happened next? Well, Twitter went really big on microservices. And I think the, the main reason that we did this was because of these autonomy problems. The perception was that if we were gonna keep scaling up the number of engineers, we couldn't have them all working in the same code base. That just wasn't, that wasn't gonna fly. Um, so uh, we, we moved to the service-oriented architecture. Oh, hmm. I don't know if you can see the colors on this, maybe not. Um, <laughs> what I was trying to get across here was that uh, in, this, in this picture, there's some pieces of leverage you get from working in this sort of container. Um, you get you know, CI deploys on call, someone handled for you, stats logging and tracing, and the, the framework of actually running the service. When you move to microservices, every service has to have all that stuff. Um, so the autonomy is really good. Engineers waste a lot less time coordinating with one another. But there are these, um, let's see. Yeah, so, so development and deployments are really decentralized. Every team can deploy its own code. Um, it's relatively hard to cause cross-cutting bugs, although it, it does happen. Um, the code base is pretty well modularized and there's good ownership of different parts of the code. Um, so those are good things for autonomy. On the other hand, uh, the leverage is not as good. So there are these pretty high per service costs. So setting up, setting up the framework, um, again, continuous integration, observability, uh, deployments. Um, it's hard to make cross-cutting changes in the system and, and this bites us quite often. Um, and a, kind of a related thing is that there are a few choke points for cross-cutting concerns. So there's certain things that you might want to apply to the entire system, like maybe access control or something like that. And it's hard to find a place to put that um, because the services all are dealing with their own domains. Um, the knowledge specialization is not very good in this setup because to run one of these services, you have to know a ton of things. You have to know about your application code. You have to know about all of these different layers, the frameworks that they're using. And you kind of have to put all these pieces together. And just to be clear, Twitter has tons of support for this. There are lots of um, libraries and auxiliary systems that deal with all these things. But you still have to put all these pieces together to, to run a new service. Um, and another problem here is that there's a lot of really gratuitous variation. So there's a lot of very similar systems that are just different for no good reason because they're run by different teams. Um, okay. Uh, I want to talk an, about another, uh, well, a few more sour patches here. Um, one issue that's come up for us is that we have, um, so we split everything into services largely on sort of application nouns. So there's a user service and a tweet service, uh, relationship services. But there's logic which is sort of cross-cutting across these things. And there isn't really a good place to put it. It doesn't really f fit into any of the services. Um, so we have this library for dealing with cross-cutting logic. And it's, um, it's kind of a problem. So uh, you get a certain amount of leverage. Sorry, I should say this library is embedded in a bunch of other services. So maybe you can see uh, there begins to be a problem there with, um, uh, with autonomy, which is that if you want to make a change to this, you have to get a whole bunch of things to deploy. So it's not just that you're stuck in one deploy queue. You actually have to run down dozens of other teams to uh, deploy this library. Um, so that's pretty bad. Um, there's also kind of a bad ownership problem here, which is that this library is not, you know, we, we tried to split both the services and the teams by these nouns, but for these cross-cutting things, there's not really a team that owns this stuff. And it's a little bit of a grab bag of different feature logic, um, and it's, it's hard to understand, like, who should even own it. Like, it just doesn't, doesn't naturally break down into good team ownership. So um, it tends to be a bit of a dumping ground for people's changes. They make feature changes, and drop them to this code base and go away, and no one is really responsible for the long-term ownership. So that's, that's a difficulty. Um, 
Okay, just a couple more. Um, this may be a little bit surprising, uh, but there are lots and lots of services at Twitter, and not all of them actually have owners. So what I tried to draw here was sort of ownership boundaries of different teams, and there's a few that just kind of get lost, and, and they keep running. They may even be really important, but um, surprisingly easy for things to get lost or transferred to some team that doesn't really own it or doesn't really understand it or something like that. Um, so this is sort of the consequence of autonomy. Like if you, you're not building into a centralized system, but you want to build a feature, so you bring up a service for it, and then you move to another team or, or whatever, um, it, it takes some work to sustain these different services. Okay. Um, one more. So I think as a response to the problems that I've been talking about, there's a strong pull to build into existing services. So it's... It's a lot of work to bring up a new one, and so people often just build into one that's handy. So that might be um, something that's somewhat related to, to the application area that they're working in. Um, so a pattern that often arises is this sort of ad hoc platform. And what I, what I mean by that is that there's some service which sort of grows to become a container for multiple application areas. Um, and the, the people who own these, so, so one model here is that there's a team that owns the container and then other teams that sort of contribute code into it for different purposes. Um, for those, those different purposes, the, the owners of those, those bits of code um, get a lot of leverage out of it because they're relying on this other team to maintain the container. Um, but they lose a lot of autonomy just as with a, a monolith. Um, they have to rely on the centralized team for deploys. Um, it's easy to cause cross-cutting bugs. Um, a big problem with this is that these things tend to be grown organically. They're just sort of driven by the pressures of, you know, what's the fastest way that I can get this piece of work done um, while maybe building into an existing system is, is easiest. Um, so they tend to be pretty ad hoc. Uh, their RPC interfaces are not always a good match for everything that runs inside them, or they, the RPC interfaces get really hairy because they're trying to accommodate a bunch of different things. Um, and the shared components within that service also tend to be kind of ad hoc. This hasn't really been thought through from the beginning, so it's not well modularized. Um, okay. So let me tell you about this new system that we've been working on. Um, it's called Strato, and it's sort of a platform for microservices. So what do I mean by that? Um, we're trying to give engineers more leverage without taking too much of their autonomy. So we have a monolithic service that hosts lots of microservices inside it. Um, the service is developed and operated by a centralized team. Uh, users develop and deploy their microservices as configuration. Um, and we provide some configurable pre-built components that are sort of capture common patterns at Twitter. So a, a typical pattern is you know, a data store with a cache on top of it um, following some schema that's easy to configure in a few lines of, of code. Um, all the microservices running in Strato uh, form a catalog with a common API that we can use in lots of different ways. And when you want to write application logic in the system, you do it in um, a domain-specific language called StratoQL, which I want to talk about a little bit. Um, so you might be wondering, this picture looks a lot like the monolith picture, except the triangles are green instead of red. Um, so how is this different from a monolith? Um, well, it is different. So, one thing we're trying to do here is split the sort of systems concerns from the application concerns as much as possible. So a typical service at Twitter mixes a lot of concerns about RPCs and timeouts and retries and things like that with application code. And we're trying to split that out as much as possible. Let you write your application code in a pretty um, stripped down way and put the system concerns in the platform as much as possible. Um, another difference is that these different microservices running in this thing are pretty isolated. So they, they each have an interface just like a thrift service does, uh, a typed interface, and it's not just a big bag of code where everyone's calling everyone, you actually ha have some modularity. So that's useful. Um, we've split the deploys into a code deploy for the platform and a config deploy for the con config, and config deploy is much lighter weight than code deploy. We can do it much more frequently. Um, so that means that different teams writing microservices in Strato can iterate a lot, a lot more quickly. Um, and a final point is that because these microservices are really small, they don't, they don't involve a lot, they don't have this whole systems platform under them, um, or sorry, they don't embody a whole systems platform, they can rely on the shared one, it's a lot easier for the org structure to match the software architecture. So if the org gets moved around, it's a lot easier to move these little services around than, than big ones. Um, 
Okay, so let me tell you a little more about that. Uh, so you might wonder, why, why do we need a new language implementation for this? Um, why not, I don't know, use Scala or something? That's what everything else is written in, or most everything else at Twitter. Um, so one big issue here is that because we're trying to run a shared platform, we're really concerned about control and operability of the platform. So we don't really want a completely unbounded language, right? Um, we get a lot of advantage from having a small and lightweight implementation, so we don't, we're not necessarily relying on the Scala compiler in our service. I think that might be d difficult. <coughs> um, we want to be able to limit the supported language features, so we don't want people to be able to, I don't know, write very heavy computations or infinite loops in our system and bring down the whole platform. So we rest restrict the language in order to do that. Um, we get a lot better control over code loading. You know, maybe we could, you could imagine doing something like compiling out bytecode and loading bytecode into the system, but um, that doesn't give us a ton of control over exactly how it happens. Um, and a final reason is that uh, we want to use types as, as runtime objects quite a bit in the system. So from these configurations that describe a microservice, we have a type describing the interface, and we want to generate, excuse me, <coughs> So we'd like to generate serialization, um, JSON interfaces. Uh, later I'll tell you about a GraphQL interface that we have on top of this. And having those types as sort of first class runtime objects is really useful. If we were just working with um, JVM bytecode, maybe we could use the reflection API or something like that, but it, it wouldn't be as easy. Um, and another reason, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, is that we'd like to have some domain-specific features. Um, and again, so our domain of microservices, wh what is that domain? Um, it might may not seem like a, a, a domain-specific idea at all, but something that happens very frequently um, at Twitter is that a service will call a whole bunch of other services and combine the results in some way. So there are two things that we'd really like to be easy in this system. Um, Twitter uses Thrift for all of its RPCs, so we'd like to make consuming Thrift really easy. Um, and because we're calling you know, dozens of services, we'd like to make concurrency really easy. Um, and th these are going to be two features that we provide in this language. Um, can I get a show of hands? How, are people familiar with Thrift for the most part? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll say a couple of things quickly about Thrift as they're relevant to this language. Okay, so Thrift RPC. Um, in Thrift RPC, like many RPC systems, you have an interface definition language um, for defining the interface between a client and server. Um, you have a bunch of types to describe this interface, primitives, um, a few collection types, uh, structs, unions, and enums. Um, you might call those records and variants in, in another language. Um, and one thing to notice about this is the communication between services is effectively like structurally typed. So you don't really care very much about um, what the types are named. It really just matters what their shape is. Um, and Thrift extends this a little bit to this idea of a compatibility relationship. So you may have two types that are not exactly the same structurally, but you can kind of figure out how to get from one to another in serialization. Um, so this turns out to be really useful, of course, uh, because you may want to upgrade different communicating services independently. Um, and the way you go about this is um, with optional and default valued fields. So if, if one side is expecting a field, it, sorry, um, you add an optional field, now either side can expect it or not expect it, and you don't have a problem um, with compatibility. Okay, so um, let me go back to telling you about StratoQL, this domain-specific language for writing microservices. So it looks a lot like Scala, um, really stripped down. So it has sort of the core of Scala, um, data objects like uh, tuples, records, variants. Um, it has pattern matching. Uh, functions, the usual stuff, but it doesn't have a lot of the fancier parts of Scala. Um, it's not object-oriented really at all. It's kind of focused on data structures and thrift, um, so not, not, we don't care so much about objects. Um, it doesn't have any of Scala's really fancy types. Um, if, you, if you do Scala, you, you know that the type system is quite complicated. Um, one thing in particular we don't care about is Java interoperability. We're, that's something, that was a goal of Scala's uh, that we don't share. Um, that makes the type system much simpler. Um, in contrast to Scala, uh, StratoQL is structurally typed. So again, I was saying that you know, Thrift is sort of inherently structurally typed, and because we're talking about a bunch of communicating RPC services, we, we follow that same thing. Um, that turns out to be 
uh, a good way to go about it. And then we have this sort of native support for thrift data, and I'll give you an example of that. But basically, um, we don't want to generate sort of stubs which may not match our thrift domain very well. We just want to embed the thrift domain directly into our language. So every thrift type is directly a type in our language, and that turns out to be really convenient. And um, did anyone see the talk la last year, strangely, about Haxel, uh, the big hammer for concurrency? One or two, okay. Cool talk, you should go look it up if you haven't seen it. Um, but StratoQL is influenced a lot by Haxel, and we have this sort of notion of transparent concurrency built into the language. And I'll show you how that works. Okay, so let me give you an example of some StratoQL code. Um, so what we're gonna do in this code is fetch some tweets in a user's timeline from a few different microservices that embody different data stores. Um, and so we're gonna get a timeline for uh, Kim Kierkegaardashian. If you don't follow Kim, you should check it out. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do here is uh, look up a user object by, by the Twitter name. So that's this user by name fetch call here. And we're gonna get back a thrift object representing the user, which has a bunch of fields. We're gonna pattern match on that to extract the user ID field. That's what this, this uh, case user ID line is about. And then we're gonna, um, we're gonna call a, a microservice that returns timelines for a particular user ID, so the home timeline for a user. Um, and what this is gonna return is thrift objects that have um, an entry for each, uh, each tweet in this timeline, it has a tweet ID, an author ID, maybe some other fields. Again, we're gonna pattern match this out. And next, we're going to look up the text of the tweet uh, using tweet by ID and the username for this user ID using user by ID. So this is kind of a contrived example, but this is pretty similar to stuff that happens at Twitter all the time. We, we have data scattered across a bunch of different services and we have to accumulate it together to produce some result. Um, so, uh, you may wonder where is the asynchrony in this, we're making a bunch of RPC calls, how do we wait for them? Um, again, this is all sort of under the hood, so we're gonna compile this language into a, an asynchronous computation and we basically don't need to worry about it at this level. Um, another thing you might notice here is that uh, it seems like we're making a call to the tweet by ID service and the user by ID service for each entry in this timeline uh, and that might turn into a lot of RPC calls um, if it's a long timeline. Uh, but this is another feature of the, this concurrency library, also um, influenced by Haxel, is that we can batch these things together um, when we know we're sending requests to the same service. So we're gonna take this computation and try to find all the things that are going in the same place and put them into a single batch. So this is what um, executing this computation looks like. Um, Okay, so we're gonna um, call the user by name service with uh, Kim Kierkegaard, get back this UID, pass it to timelines by user ID, and then we're gonna make two batch calls, and I've tried to draw these thick arrows to indicate that we're making batch calls, kind of simultaneously to these two other services, and when those have both returned, then we can produce the result. Um, okay, so how's this all working out? Um, pretty well. <laughs> We've got a lot of usage of this system at Twitter. Uh, over 200 microservices are running in it. Um, there's a lot of traffic. It's started to approach some of our other big centralized services. Um, we have been building a GraphQL layer on top of this um, for use in our mobile clients. And um, a nice thing about that, sorry, I'm gonna talk about the next. Um, we're also building a hosted event processing system, so kind of like Amazon Lambda, where we can use this language to write event processors. Um, so it's, it's going pretty well. Um, is this a sweet spot? Um, yes and no. So there's obviously a large gain in leverage for users over writing their own microservices. Um, we capture a lot of common infrastructure and configuration and uh, people don't have to operate things themselves. That's sort of centralized. Um, application logic owners have a lot of autonomy because um, their microservices are separated. You know. Um, they own their own piece of code, it's not just a big bag of code. Um, and they have, they're sort of freed of the central deploy cube. Um, we, they can deploy configuration very frequently. Um, compared to some of the other sweet spots I mentioned, many customers want roughly the same thing, but um, there's a really long tail of people who want different things. Um, so that turns out to be a little bit of a problem. Um, this is not as simple a system as some of the other ones that I mentioned. Um, so we have some downsides here. 
uh, the interface of this capability is kind of complicated. Um, making a new language has a really high bar. Um, the language implementation, the documentation, libraries that the language supports, IDEs support, all these things. And a centralized team having to be responsible for all this becomes another kind of bottleneck um, for people who want to use it. And as with these other uh, sweet spots that I mentioned, it can be difficult to debug platform level issues. And of course, if Strato is down, many microservices are done. Um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I just want to briefly note that there's some emergent benefits of a centralized platform. So this GraphQL front end I mentioned, it's hard to imagine how that would work if it needed to front all of the different microservices at Twitter. But having a catalog of services with similar interfaces in Strato makes it much more straightforward. We have all, this, all the types in one place. It's very easy to generate a GraphQL interface from that. And I'll skip over the next part. Um, I'll skip over that part. Okay, I wanna make a little conjecture here. Um, I think programming languages are a good tool for building the kind of sweet spot that I'm talking about. And I wanna leave you with a quote from um, Janine Atkinson who gave a cool talk about how to tell when you've accidentally written a language and what to do about it. Um, any program with sufficiently complicated user input contains a computer programming language implementation which is likely to not be very well thought out. Um, I think what we've tried to do with Strato, at least, um, is to think it out a little bit um, and make this work well. Okay, um, thank you. I, I don't have time for questions, but if you wanna come talk to me after, please do. And if you'd like to know more about StratoQL, I'm giving another talk later today um, about the language implementation at the Scala workshop. So that's in um, the Frisco room, which I think is across the atrium and upstairs, if you're interested. Thank you very much.